Awesome. Hey everyone, how are you? Uh, came from the US, so that hurt a little bit when we came in second. Um, won't lie. The uh, only thing keeping me afloat is the Yankees are winning in the World Series, or getting there, so we'll see. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> hey, I'm trying to go to the Leafs game tonight, okay? I'm trying to be local, right? So. <laughs> go Canes. Um, so, what we were talking about here, right? So, non human identity, right? This is a, uh, a space from real. First, let's, I guess, let's talk about who I am, right? Uh, I am from the US, uh, Marine veteran, US. Uh, I've done a lot of different practices. I've done data fabrics, networking, security, um, kind of everywhere. I don't like to be one thing. Uh, a lot of it's self-taught. Uh, so the events, uh, the CFT, uh, you know, uh, events, the you know, networking, discords, like get engaged. That's how you're going to learn. Um, you know, the you know, the other part behind it, you know, that's more relevant to this is you know, building out socks and playbooks and runbooks for uh, Department of Defense um, operation centers for Cisco. Um, and then more talking about you know, kind of the attack side. So I've been on the attack side and the defense side. Um, you know, you'll see throughout this talk, you know, one of my models I, I say whenever I go somewhere is, if you don't know how to attack something, you don't know how to defend it. Uh, so that is a big piece of why I try to teach the attack side along with the defense uh, to go there. So uh, first we're gonna talk about what non-human identities are. It's a big buzzword term uh, that came out about 18 months ago, two years ago. Um, little disclaimer, I do come from a company that does non-human identity security. Uh, we're a startup that's been around for about three years. Uh, we are Israeli-based. We are um, you know, penetrating the market in the US. We're also here in you know, Europe and also in Canada uh, and other places. But we're gonna talk about um, you know, what are non-human identities, you know, get rid of the, the marketing term and kind of talk about what the actual problem is. Uh, we're also gonna talk about you know, what is the attack surface and why should you care. Uh, then we're going to walk through, I have a recorded attack, uh, it's easier than you know, with this, you know, copy and pasting or typing. Um, and then go through some defense techniques besides buy my product, right? That's not what I want to tell you. I want you guys to be able to actually do this on your own. Um, if it leads you to buying product, great, right? But that's not why we're here today. Uh, so what are non-human identities? I always think Webster's pretentious for having his own dictionary, so I like to make my own. Uh, and I like to call it, uh, you know, what is a non-human identity? It's programmatic access to processes and data where a human does not have to be involved, right, or required to be involved. So you think, you know, what does that actually mean, right? You know, we're talking about API keys, service accounts, uh, some of the lesser knowns, right, you know, the, the extensions, application extensions, web hooks, um, you know, OAuth apps, machine identities, right? Uh, you know, these are the items we're talking about uh, these are items that kind of fall through the cracks uh, because they're in different verticals. They touch different verticals. They go cross cloud, cross SaaS, uh, cross different environments. So they kind of fall into those gaps. Um, so how did we get here, right? So there's a couple of ways that NHIs make it into our system. Uh, one, you know, everyone's seen the one on the left. Everyone's probably done it three times in the past month, right? You know, allowing access when you start a new job, onboarding a new app, giving it access, right? That creates a token. Uh, that's going to go from there. You know, we have other humans creating NHIs, right? Which is creating an API key manually, creating a service account in AD, uh, going from that point of view. And then, you know, where we started seeing the boom, and we'll talk about that here in a second, is the NHIs creating NHIs, programmatic access of creating new programmatic access, right? So you can see how this kind of, kind of has an exponent factor. Uh, some of the early research uh, is, you know, we're safe to say that for every one employee, there's typically about 20 uh, in a company, right? So you think about 1,000 employees, 20,000 NHIs. Uh, this does balloon up to up into the 70s to one, uh, depending if there's heavy development, heavy pieces. Uh, so how did we get here, right? You know, what, did, what caused this to actually happen? Uh, you know, we used to start with legacy on-premise. We were AD on-prem, we had our IDP, we had something that was our source of truth and that was the only way you could access our systems. Uh, from there, we moved to the cloud era, right? Everything was role-based. We were giving machines identities to do items. We were also being very granular, giving them multiple ID, you know, identities to do items. Uh, then became the, the magical digital transformation period where everything went to SaaS, pass, you know, anything as a service. Uh, that created a lot of external connections into your system, 
marketplace, uh, you know, making sure all these apps can talk to each other. Uh, and we're only seeing this balloon even further up with you know, the amazing amount of Gen AI developers that are out there now that are creating all these different cool apps that we want to put into the piece, right? So it's, it's creating a, this balloon effect. So there's also, besides technology, business processes that are leading to why this is happening. Uh, you know, there's mergers and acquisitions, right? You're bringing in junk uh, that you don't know about, you don't have the backstory on, you don't know why the service account exists. We don't want to play the scream test game and try to rip it out and see what it breaks. Uh, offboarding gaps, right? You know, the, traditionally, humans are not tied to the non-human identities. We don't know who actually created the service account unless it's a record. We don't know who last updated, who still needs it, API keys, uh, you know, SSH to, you know, keys, all these other pieces. Uh, you know, we're trying to create all these connections between different systems, right? It's creating more noise, creating more connections, creating more lateral movement process. Uh, and then obviously you know, automating the processes, right? So having the ability to actually not sit there and do that, right? So what is the attack surface, right? There's really two or, or four, uh, really two categories, external, internal, right? External is the ones that you always hear about, right? You know, someone you know, got a token leaked, someone got a vendor breach, someone got... Uh, something of that nature, right? That's the external. The internal is more, you know, insider threat, uh, using a service account to go elsewhere, uh, lateral movement, uh, privilege escalation, right? So what does an external direct attack look like? Something as simple as this, right? We have broken webhooks with keys in them and passwords in them. We have uh, a leak token. Uh, we'll see that here a little bit later in, in the attack. We also can get stuff back through API calls and headers, right? There's secrets and, and other items we can get back. Uh, really why it, business is starting to care is because the attacks are starting to be used, right? Uh, and this is where we start seeing all the news articles. I call this unfortunate free marketing for myself, right? Because it happens and it's bad, uh, but it brings attention to the area, right? We're seeing about at least one major one a month uh, between GitHub, CircleCI, Hugging Face, AWS, right? And these are all environments that touch many customers, right? Uh, and we'll see how that makes an impact here uh, in a little bit. But uh, the, you know, the Cloudflare one actually came from the Okta breach, right? Okta got breached, which turned into a Cloudflare breach, right? Uh, and then Cloudflare, all of their stuff got uh, in a little bit of trouble, right? Uh, and what actually happened uh, to kind of break down where this came from, it was a, someone in the support center for Okta uh, had a, a human-based attack, a ransomware attack. They had a service account that had access to the HAR files uh, which are session, uh, session tokens for their customers. Uh, that was able to be accessed, and they were accessing customer systems. They got to Cloudflare. Uh, Cloudflare was notified by Okta to rotate all tokens. They had 5,000 connections from Okta into Cloudflare. Missed four. Those four got compromised, right? So having the ability to see where, you know, how small it can be of a mistake to make a huge problem uh, kind of goes from there. So let's see what an attack actually looks like, right? Uh, so this is the attack you're about to see. It's about eight minutes. I do it at double time because it's usually an hour talk. Uh, but this is uh, you know, what we're actually going to try to do, right? The real three pieces I want you to keep in mind is, what well, we're going to gain access uh, in a way that's pretty easy. Uh, we're going to do lateral movements. So we're going to try to see where else we can go. Uh, and then we're going to steal, conceal, and persist, right? We want to get some sort of financial gain to get some sort of physical gain from this attack. We don't want to just do it just to do it. Uh, maybe we do, but not today. Uh, we also want to conceal, right? We don't want to just give away the breadcrumbs of what we did, and we want to persist. We'd like to come back, right? We don't want to be a one-time visitor. We want to be able to come back into this environment, maybe a different way, right? So before we you know, walk into the attack, there's a couple things to know. One, in this scenario, we're targeting a company called Square CD, uh, not a real company. Uh, and we're targeting them from just looking at all their developers, all their developers' GitHubs, finding public repos, uh, and we're going to find a token that's been leaked, right? So, but the other piece that's more informational uh, that you want to know is that uh, keys have characteristics, right? Tokens have characteristics. Uh, you know, I always get the question is, so I lose a key, so what, right? If I drop a physical key on the ground, if I pick it up, I'm going to know either goes to a mailbox, a car, it goes to a house, right? I may not know what car. Uh, I may get some sort of indicator based on an emblem on, on the key, right? But I can still tell there's somewhat of a physical difference between the keys. Same thing for the logical keys, right? They've fixed prefixes. They have fixed key lengths. Uh, there's a lot of characteristics that people who find these keys can easily say, I know where this goes, right? Uh, that's why we have secret scanning uh, 
type tools because that's what they're looking for, right? So I'll talk through this uh, as we go, right? So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna first clone the repo uh, that we have uh, for, this public, uh, for this public repo for this user at uh, Square City as developer. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and CD into it and we're gonna run a open source tool called Git Leaks. Uh, what this is gonna find is two secrets. One's a webhook, one is an AWS access key, right? So we can see the file where that key is, is a shell file. So we're gonna go ahead and try to cat it out and we're actually gonna see that we don't find it, right? So something's puzzling here, right? What we're then gonna see is that we're gonna look at the branches and actually see that the leak is an unmerged branch, which happens a lot. Orphan branches, unmerged branches. And if you have a SAS DAS tool, that typically only looks at the main branch, right? There's a lot of data out there. We don't care about the rest. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna look at the commit and we're gonna find the access key and the secret key, right? So now we've gone from a, a public GitHub repo that they probably downloaded a project to do something uh, you know, themselves, but they didn't wipe out the unmerged branch. We're going to create a new AWS profile with this key to see if it works, right? So what we're gonna do is you know, get caller identity. This is gonna be the who am I of AWS to understand that yes, we're a user and we're a Square CD, CICD service account, right? Great, we have something. So we're gonna stay on the non-human side and we're gonna start listing secrets in Key Manager. So we're gonna list secrets to understand are there any secrets I have access to? In this case, we have two, right? We have CICD, Slackbot, and we also have a personal access token in Prod. Uh, we're gonna use the Slack bot because it's also named CICD. There's a good chance we have access to it, and we do, right? We have two keys inside here, two values. One, as we talked about with the prefixes, we can tell one is a uh, XOX is Slack, B is a bot, P is a user, right? So I can see that I'm gonna put in Postman uh, these two values because I'm gonna start using the Slack public API endpoint because conveniently they gave us enough public API endpoints to figure out where it goes. Right? So now we're going to use uh, this public API endpoint to say, you know, like, who am I? Right? The who am I of the Slack, right? So we're gonna do first do the bot token because it typically has less privilege. Uh, we're gonna see that it is valid, right? We have a Slack workspace that we can see, but the more interesting parts can be in the headers. In the headers, I can see what the actual scopes of what this key can do against that workspace. Right, so this is all public information, right? Now I can see, okay, let's go ahead and look at the user. They have more scopes. One of the most dangerous ones we've seen in this is channels history, which is actually a very misleading one, which actually means I can read all history of public and private DMs, right? So that's a more of a user token. We're gonna look at which channels are in here. We see a couple called dev, we call CICD, right? So, okay, it makes sense. So now we're gonna do a search against the history of all these channels looking for a prefix of an AWS access key. We've already known that we did it before, so chances are we may find it again, and we get lucky, right? Who's seen this message about 100 times if they've done this, right? Please delete this key after you're done copying it to your password manager, right? We see this all the time in customer environments, so we're gonna go ahead and create a new profile using this new AWS access key. I've already copied it in to save us a little bit of time here, and we're gonna see that, you know, we're gonna do the same thing, caller identity. Is this even a valid key, right? It's great that we found it. It is, right? And now it's their bad day. Now I have an admin key, right? It could be admin, it could be maintenance, it could be something. I've now escalated my privilege to something else. Now I can see the permissions. I have secrets read write. I can make my own. I have S3, I have RDS, right? I have a lot of cool things inside there. So I'm gonna list those secrets again, see if there's any more that I have access to. Uh, and I can see that, you know, we're gonna try that other secret which is that prod personal access token. Personal access token is an API key for GitHub, for anyone who didn't know. Uh, and I'm gonna see that they have that key there. Again, I don't need them to label it for me. I can see with GHP that it's gonna be a personal access token for GitHub. I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing. I'm gonna list all repos uh, that, this private, that this key has access to. And I'm going to see one right here called Square CD app prod, which is a private repo inside their organization that they have access to. I'm gonna put that repo inside another environment variable, and I'm going to read the contents of this to go ahead and see if I can actually you know, describe what's going on inside here. And I'm looking for a few things, right? I can see the readme file, that's fun, right? I can tell what it does. Uh, but I'm gonna start hitting some gold here in a second. It's scripts, you know, maybe there's another password. Here we go, I have source code, right? This is what I came for, and this is what I want. 
I want the source code and I'm gonna take it, right? So what I'm gonna do from here is I'm gonna actually clone this repo, right? So I'm gonna take this repo, but I also don't want them to know what I did, right? So I'm gonna start poking around S3, right? Everyone's favorite cloud protection, right? Everyone's going after my S3 bucket, so let's pretend like we did, right? So we're gonna conceal our actions by going after our data breach, right? So now we're gonna probably set up a whole bunch of bells and whistles. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead as fast as we can. We're going to actually see that we can see three buckets. Uh, one's called customer connector keys, right? Customer connector keys has a whole bunch of JSON files in it, right? Customer connector keys also has one called important customer. Right? So we're gonna see, okay, let's copy down this key and see what this key actually is, or see what this JSON file actually is. Is it just a document? Is it an actual key? What do we have? So we downloaded it. We can see that we have important customer right there. We're gonna cat it out, and we're gonna actually see it's an access key to Google Cloud. Right? So this is now another environment that we're getting access to. The most important part is that it's not to their environment. We've now moved from being against Square CD to turning Square CD into a supply chain attack. Now we're going after their customers. So what we're doing now is we're going to list all the projects we have access to. We're also going to see you know, what can we actually do. We see we have an editor role. right? That editor role is all we need to start creating our own fun stuff inside this account. So we're going to create our own secret. right? We're going to create our own secret, which is going to, is it done? OK, it's done. I don't know why it's done. but. Uh, what we would do next is we're going to actually create a wait, wait, did I miss what I was talking? No, nope, okay. So what we did next, we would actually create a service account with that key to actually create a backdoor in a customer environment that they have no idea we were in there in the first place. Right? So we've actually gone from doing this, right? If we you know recap this in a nutshell, right? We started with a an Oculus, you know, API key that we found out in a public repo that someone had not merged to their main. Maybe they were cleaning it up before they used it. They did something cool at work. They want to do it for their public side, but they never cleaned it up before they actually uh, got around to it. We found it, right? We're going to go ahead and jump between all these different SaaS and cloud environments, right? And then we're going to go ahead, steal that source code, which was what we came there for. That was our money maker, right? Because now we can use that for many different things. And then we, you know, by concealing our crime, we stumbled upon other items in S3 buckets that gave us the ability to actually create uh, you know, a supply chain attack where we got into him, strike to him, you know, where we got into other customer environments and turned them into from a target to a supply chain attack, and now we're targeting their customers. Now they have to send out that terrible email from legal that says, rotate all keys, rotate all tokens, but it doesn't matter if they do. We've already created more access in those environments anyway. I don't care what they do from that point of view. Now I'm going to keep going down that chain, right? So how prevalent is this issue, right? So the you know, question all you get is, well, who's targeting me, right? They don't have to be, right? And this is a, this is a cool piece of information that uh, a company called Cybernary uh, did some research on this. They're a consulting firm. Uh, what they did was they put canary tokens, which are just tokens that are real tokens, but they don't go anywhere. Think of honeypots, right, that are out there in the wild. And all they're trying to see is, do people find them, right? If people find them, what happens to them? What do they try to do? Notify me, all these pieces, right? So what's actually happening here is that when he put the keys inside of all these different types of environments, the infographic on the right is how fast they were robotically picked up. So this is robotic pickups. This is not someone targeting them. They just threw it out into these different environments and saw how fast do I get a hit that someone's trying to use this key because it's now publicly leaked. Right, and this is how fast they were. And it's a really interesting article. I, I, at the end, I have a QR code that actually has this article in there. Uh, it's a really interesting read, right? Because you can actually see that where he thought he was going to be breached or where he thought he was going to be attacked was not where he was attacked. And that's one of the other parts when I talk to just businesses and, and customers is no one's sitting in your, your business meetings. No one knows what your crown jewels are, right? They're just finding, trying to find a way in. They will find your crown jewels later, but they don't, they don't know what you're trying to protect heavily. They're just going to see what they can find, right? Uh, the other part is you'll see the next action taken, right? They tried to get caller identity, figure out who they are. They tried to invoke models, using AI models against your environment, right? It's a scary one, right? They're trying to list secrets, list vaults, right? They're not trying to get any rust. They're trying to keep doing the same method. They're trying to continue the non-human side because it's persistent access. I don't need biometrics. I don't need an MFA token. I don't need all these other pieces, right? I'm just going to keep going down this path. 
so how do we protect it, right? Uh, there's some basic ones that even if you put it into GPT or, or, or Gemini, or whatever, they give you these ones, right? But these are kind of basics that we need to go back to, right? Which is proper active inventory, right? Having the ability to see at all times, what is my inventory across cloud, SaaS, on-prem, which ones talk to each other, uh, which ones still need to be active, right? Um, you know, tying those back to who is the human ownership, business ownership, financial ownership, technical ownership, right? Um, you know, proper offboarding processes, right? Um, you know, if, if this gentleman in the front row, if you left my company, right, I need to know that when I remove you from the company, you don't have SSH keys, you don't have tokens, you don't have anything on your laptop that you could then come back and get to my system, right? So understanding, you know, what are those proper offboarding processes? Uh, expiry notices, right, you know, for tokens, keys, right? Nothing needs a forever lifetime. Even if you think the project's gonna be around for five years, set it for 180 days, you know, every year, whatever it may be, make a process where it's reviewed, right? Make a process where it's actually looked at more than once. You know, if you, you, know, if you ever see not, never expire on a token, that's a problem, right? That, that should never exist. There's no persistent access forever uh, that should exist. Uh, least privilege, right? You'll, you'll get from, you know, I came from the dev side to the security side, right? I call it going to the dark side, right? So uh, what you can also see inside there is there's conflicting mantras, right? You know, dev wants to say, hey, just give me access so I can make something really cool, right? Security's like, well, hold on, you're creating a gap, right? Uh, you know, continue to say, hold on, you're creating a gap. Don't worry about holding up business, right? Do not create that gap. Do not let them say, hey, I, I'm gonna, you know, just give me, you know, high level privileges, contributor access. Once I'm running it, I'll come back to you and tell you what I need. They're never coming back. I can tell you, they're never coming back. They're not losing that access, right? Uh, so don't buy that story. Uh, setting rotation, right? Uh, another part, educating end users, right? End users are creating this access as well. When they allow connections, you know, they come from HR, they come from sales, they come from all these other places. Uh, very similar to how we started doing phishing uh, you know, attempts, right? We can use NHIs for phishing. It's another one I do where I use Slack messages and Teams messages to send messages and get them to do stuff, right? Uh, you know, but understanding that these acts, you know, these cool new widgets, cool new apps that don't have to make them work as hard, right? They have a level of risk that come with them. Educate them, right? The ones we've seen companies that are educated that they respond the same way that those who are educating their end users on phishing respond, right? No one's clicking on that package label that's waiting downstairs for them. No one's doing that, well, hopefully. No one's doing that anymore, but they, they know now, right? They know not to click. Same thing with all these different extensions. Uh, you know, a little bit deeper, um, if we wanted to say, like, how do we go a little bit above just basics, right? How do we start looking at these non humanitarian from a active threat monitoring uh, perspective? One of the toughest parts about uh, NHIs is the fact that they come with a level of nuisance from the money side, right? And when I say that is uh, anyone who's run a SIM or run a project for a SIM knows that collecting, dog, collecting logs costs a lot of money, right? Ingest costs a lot of money. So what do we do? We do risk reward analysis, right? We say, hey, I don't care that Okta's authenticated 5,000 times correctly today. I'm good, I don't need this log anymore, right? It only takes that one time for it to go bad, right? So again, not telling you to turn it on, right? That's, that's a cost analysis piece. Um, that's actually where we come into play. But the, the other part is that, you know, setting up the ones that, you know, if you do throw out Canary tokens, if you throw out some stuff like that, right? See what people are doing at your environment. So, you know, set up monitoring alerts, set up, you know, different events that say, hey, how do I go ahead and take action based on items I never want happening inside my environment? Uh, some elevated ones, right? These are always the fun ones. Uh, canary tokens, you'll read the article, you'll see it, I guarantee you'll try it, right? It's actually a really cool way to see what's going on inside your environment in a very easy way, they're free. Uh, there's, you know, there's sites that give you free canary tokens to use. Use them carefully, right? But also use them uh, to make sure you know where they're going. Uh, it's a great way to just say, hey, what is my real attack surface from the outside, right? Not what I perceive it as, but what are other people doing? Um, you know, engage in pen tests. You know, everyone in this room probably doesn't need to be convinced that, about that. Uh, and I won't dare to use the term purple team. Uh, but, you know, a lot of those things come into play, right? You know, when you talk about learn to attack it, learn to defend it, 
uh, it's, a, it's a good practice to know both sides, to know how they interact with each other, to know how they're going to complement each other. If you keep losing to the red team, find out why, right? I guarantee I know how they're, they're doing it, because I did it, right? And you know, we, we did a red team event where uh, we were the first time that that actual event had ever been caught. Uh, it was the easiest POV we ever did in my life, right? So, uh, but there's a lot of cool things you can do by making a, you know, a, a cool piece from that point of view. Uh, security chaos engineering. It's, uh, it's something I do for, you know, you'll see it a lot on the dev side with just chaos engineering, but understanding where are my redundancies, where are my lateral movements, where am I, you know, can I actually kill something if I tried, right? If I said, hey, I'm gonna kill your access after you do something, how do they still have access, right? You know, understanding where those kill chains are, understanding you know, where my redundancies are, understanding you know, do they have more access than they possibly need, right? There's a lot of cool things you can do uh, from that point of view. But, uh, so that's it uh, from that point of view. Um, this QR code, uh, I do a lot of you know, creating content as well. You can follow me on LinkedIn if you want. Uh, but there's other, we did a really cool, I think it's like a 40 page document, the Cloud Security Alliance. Just talk about the state of, of non-human identities. What are people doing about today? How do they care about it? You know, what, what are they using uh, from a purely just you know, industry standard? Uh, the link to that uh, Canary token piece is in there. Uh, I do update it pretty weekly depending on where I am. Uh, and what's going on in the news. So, uh, but yeah, that's it. I'll, I'll be here for uh, questions. Yeah, we have a few minutes for questions, so if anybody wants to ask them. Thank you. Right here. Yeah, the, uh, thank you for the, the monitoring page. I was going to ask a question, but you covered it. <laughs> and I'd only say the other trick we've encountered and used is not just looking for usage, but looking for where they are successfully used. Yes. So Yeah, it's a good question, right? So it, it really depends on the level of usage monitoring and what's the reaction to that usage monitoring. Is it, is it something that says, hey, it's being used from a different IP in a different location, I want to notify you. Is there an actual piece to go ahead and kill it? Uh, is there a place to, you know, you know there, there's a lot of components from that point of view. Um, you'll see I didn't use any special tricks or any, you know, it's just literally describing and go, right? Uh, so if I have access, right, if they have a, uh, you know, maybe a whitelist or they have a blacklist, things of that nature, right? There could be ways that I, I can't actually use the key. Right now I'd find another one, right? Uh, from that point of view, I'm just saying like this is, this, this is a normal environment we encounter all the time uh, from that point of view. But yeah, there, there's many ways to go about it, right? There's, you know, by all means, it's not a, you know, one-stop shop to fix this. Uh, it's more about, you know, bringing the awareness about how easy this is uh, if, they're, if the path allows. So you're hurt first. Go ahead. Going back to the, uh, the uh, graph you had with, uh, from was it Cybermary? With, uh, Cybernary? Stat, yeah, Cybernary, just stats on how long Greg uh, took to from. Uh, where is that? Is that available on their site? Or yeah, so it's an article. Uh, yeah, if you click that, QR, it's, on, it's on my little link tree there um, yeah, from that point of view. So it's a, if you look up Cybernary, um, I think the article is called like, Worst Place to Leave Your Tokens or something like that. Um, but it's, it's a really, really, really cool art. It's very in-depth as well. Uh, they go through the different sections uh, of going from there. Perfect. Thank you. How do you combat the thought of, I need to get this working and I'll come back to you and talk to you when I've got it working and we'll figure out the rights? It sounds like you don't have a good plan, so we're not putting in operation, right? So that's, that's the, the easy way, right? If there's, if there's a financial gain from pressure from the business, right? Um, that's one thing, right? But you need, as long as you're raising the flag, right? You raise the flag that says, hey, this is not something that security team is comfortable with. Put the caveats around it, say why. You know, try to put white lists around it. Try to put something, some sort of protective bubble around what's going on from that point of view. Um, but again, they're not gonna like the hearing it, but you just tell them. Like, if you can't tell me what access you need, you don't know what you're doing, right? So that's a big piece to push back on them on. Um, you're not, it's a, I've been on both sides. I was going to get really on a tirade there for a second, but um, <laughs> you're, you're not their subjects to push around, right? So you'll be, make sure it's a, it's a conductive uh, conversation, 
have your backing, have your, uh, your research, right? Say, hey, here's the, you know, what you want. You know, maybe you want contributor role, editor role, because you don't want to be, you know, org delineated or user delineated when we start getting down to like really granular. Uh, tell them what the impact of that could possibly be. And are they willing to accept that risk for the business, right? Um, and and then leave it up to, you know, that business unit, that, you know, manager, director, whoever, to make that decision of, hey, I'm willing to throw my hand up to say that, yes, we need to provide that access because it's critical, it's you know, money for the business, kind of go from there. You've done your job, so to speak, right? Uh, maybe we want to turn on non-interactive logs or something like that for that you know, piece for that little bit uh, to see what's actually going on. But uh, yeah, try to baseline it, you know, make them go through the proper channels. It's, it's a big problem, right? And, and that's why we have a product, right? We're not here just to you know, throw stuff out there. Well, we, we have a product that does that human ownership. We actually have uh, behavior analysis as well, tell you what is it touching, where is it touching from, how active is it, right? You know, to give you the understanding of, you know, if Barry leaves the company, does Mary need to now own this token, right? From that point of view, or can it leave with Barry? Right, so there's a lot of different heuristics you can look at and a lot of different usage uh, you can look at from that point of view, but that, that is a major challenge uh, creating for that. It's even worse when you have an MFA and you take someone else's junk into your environment and they have no idea because we got rid of their team, they left, whatever it may be. Uh, so it's one of the biggest issues. Okay, maybe one more, one more question and you can answer while we get the next speaker. Perfect, sounds good. Up. That would be great. Good. Yeah, so, so we're watching vaults, we're watching variables, we're also watching for leaks, right? So did someone you know, not use the variable and use the plain text instead, right? You know, tie it back to the commit, tie it back to the, the developer did the commit, tie it back to the owner of the token, right? Let them know that they need to rotate, right? Let them know uh, what the appropriate process is. But yeah, that's, it's not a one-stop uh, one shop for everything to fix this, but we're, we're trying to get there, right? So uh, yeah, we can handle a lot of that problem. Awesome. Right. Thank you, everyone. Oh.